In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. The Chaplain's Report today, I had a really great experience over this past weekend. My friends got me a really thoughtful Christmas present. There was a show that was going on in Huntsville. And that's actually the reason I didn't have a show yesterday is because I was still coming back from Huntsville uh, and, and didn't have time to get a show together. So I came back from this the show in Huntsville where C.S. Lewis, an actor portraying C.S. Lewis, was sitting there on the stage and, and trying to have a conversation with the audience. So the, the whole shtick of the show is they, they try to make it like a conversation between you and C.S. Lewis if you went to visit him while he was still alive at his home in, in England. And it's a really fantastic show. It's, it's one of the, the best gifts that I've ever received personally. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I really appreciate Chris and Allison for doing that for me. Um, it, it was a great experience. And there were a lot of things that I learned from C.S. Lewis's life that it just, it fits so well with his body of work. And if you've ever talked to me about theology or, or talked to me about my favorite authors or my books, C.S. Lewis is definitely my favorite author. It's, it's really not even close. And so it really made me think of a passage, one in particular where he's talking about death and how he was preparing for it. Because remember that the, the play is supposed to take place not long before Lewis actually does die in 1963. And it really made me think of, of this Bible verse that happens in Hebrews 11. Now, to understand what is being talked about by the Hebrew author here, you have to understand that Hebrews is often referred to, at least chapter 11 is, as the Hall of Fame of Faith. So when you're watching the quote-unquote Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews 11, you get to the end of it, or you, well, actually more like the middle, but you get to this part where after it's talked about these great spiritual leaders like Abraham and Moses, and then it gets to this part where it gives a little bit of commentary on it, where it says uh, in Hebrews eleven thirteen through 16, All these died in faith, without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles, on this earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, this is just an absolutely phenomenal passage of Scripture. And it's such a great summary of many Bible narratives kind of rolled into one. Because one thing that you'll notice is they, the, the way that it characterizes these great spiritual leaders is that they work towards a goal, but they never actually got to the goal. It was something that they saw in a distance, far off somewhere that God was leading them that they couldn't quite see, they couldn't quite put their finger on, but they knew it was out there, and because they walked by faith and were obedient to God, they set out towards the city that they cannot yet see. And the way that it describes it, it really brings it into perspective, because virtually every hero in the Bible, he leaves unfinished work. Almost all of them. Very few of them actually accomplish the goal that God sets them on. I mean, there's countless examples of this. They just never seem to see the full fruition of what they're working toward. Moses does not enter the promised land with the children of Israel. He sees it from across the Jordan from a mountaintop, but he never actually leads them into the promised land or enters into it. He dies before he does so. You look at King David. King David had a burning desire not only to see God's people thrive, but to worship God in his temple. 
And God tells him, David, that's that's not for you. You can prepare the way for that. You can you can make accommodations for someone else to do it, but ultimately your son's going to build it. That is not the task that I have for you. He saw it from afar off. He, he made preparations for it, but he never got to see the temple himself. And I could go through countless different examples of this, but I think probably the one that impacts us the most is Jesus Christ. Jesus came here to bring the kingdom to us, to save his people from their sins, and to create a holy nation, a priesthood, that is redeemed by his blood. And when does he ascend to heaven? Before that happens. Directly before, in fact. The kingdom doesn't show up until the day of Pentecost. And so even Jesus, God in the flesh, left this earth before his work was finished. I think that really speaks to us because as human beings, and it's just human nature and I do the same thing, we are constantly worried about finishing the goal, reaching the destination. And there's a lot of good to that. These men that we're talking about in Hebrews 11 did the same thing. But ultimately, we have to remember that our ultimate goal is not one we are going to reach in our lifetime. We are always going to leave unfinished work. We are always going to leave people behind. That's just the nature of being human. It was true of Moses and David and Jesus and John the Baptist and so many others. And it will be true of us one day as well. C.S. Lewis spoke on this matter in a letter to Mary Willis Shelburne on June 17, 1963. And this is what Lewis wrote. Pain is terrible, but surely you need not have fear as well. Can you not see death? As a friend and deliverer, it means stripping off that body which is tormenting you, like taking off a hair, shirt, or getting out of a dungeon. What is there to be afraid of? You have long attempted, and none of us more so, a Christian life. Your sins are confessed and absolved. Has this world been so kind to you that you should leave it with regret? There are better things ahead than any we leave behind. Remember, Though we struggle against things because we are afraid of them, it is often the other way around. We get afraid because we struggle. Are you struggling? Resisting? Don't you think our Lord says to you, Peace, child, peace, relax, let go. Underneath our everlasting arms. Let go. I will catch you. Do you trust me so little? Of course, this may not be the end. Then make it a good rehearsal. Yours and it like you a tired traveler near the journey's end, Jack. Now, this particular letter was penned in June of 1963, just a few weeks before he had his heart attack and only five months before Lewis died. He understood that the end was coming, and you see that at the tail end of his letter in the way that he signs off, that he is also near his journey's end. You know, in reading that letter, you can detect the eagerness. And he said in his own personal writings that when he had his heart attack, there was even a little bit of anticipation. Almost like he was joyous that the end was on its way. But the Lord saw fit to keep him on earth, for a few months longer, and then eventually he did pass and was able to to go on. You see, like Abraham, Lewis understood that we are ultimately pilgrims. We don't belong here. This land is not made for us. This is not the place that God intends for us to live. God tells us to set out for a city that we cannot see a destination that we don't know what it's actually like. He gives us some description, but ultimately we don't understand, and he never intended for us to understand every detail of what that home is going to be like. And that is why the world always treats us like outcasts, like outsiders, because we are. Living like Jesus does not grant you any kind of favor with the world. If anything, it puts you at odds with it just like it did with Jesus himself. And Lewis wrote this 
so beautifully in some of his fiction. In The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the very last scene, Reepicheep, one of the characters, who is a knight and has been a knight and a warrior virtually his entire life, he gets to the end, the shore, Aslan's country, the Narnian version of heaven. And before he sets off, he draws his blade and sets it in the sand and says, I guess I won't need this anymore. This is a concept Lewis understood. When heaven comes, you leave all that behind. The things that you needed, the things that defined you in this world, you don't need them anymore, most of them. Because you were a warrior and a pilgrim here on this earth, but that's not the way that it's going to be when we're in our true home. The home that has been designed for us, not built by human hands. There's another instance in the Chronicles of Narnia, the last battle, in the very last chapter, and I know I'm giving a spoiler here, but the book's like, I don't know, over 70 years old at this point, so I don't think that I need to issue a spoiler warning. In the last battle, the last place that they go to, Aslan's country, when, when all the characters wind up in the Narnian version of heaven again, they talk about all these things that remind them of what it was like to be alive, and then they realize, no, it's actually the other way around. We liked things here on this side of eternity, on this earth, because they reminded us of what the true home was supposed to be like. You go further up and further in, as Lewis writes, and the more you do, the more at home you are. It's like a layer where every layer that you go further into is actually larger and grander and better than the last. And that is why he wrote what he did about anticipating this future home with great eagerness. You see, the whole series is a series of struggles between these characters and the forces of darkness, all the hardship and pain that they went through, and winning some victories along the way. But ultimately, it was a struggle the entire time when they reach the last place, when they have left what he refers to as the shadow land, the shadow of the former in other words, the parts of the world that seem like heaven but ultimately fall short. Once we finally left that, we'll be truly at home, and we'll understand why we loved the things here as much as we did. Because that will be a land that we are designed for when our journey has come to an end, when we are no longer pilgrims in a strange land, when we join the others in the, as a citizen of heaven. That's where we truly belong. You see, ultimately, all of our lives are just jumping from one struggle to the next. Life is a constant struggle. And when we finish one, you can rest sure another one is coming up just around the corner. So many people live their lives trying to get comfortable and just kind of cruise along and, and get to what we refer to as the good life. There is no utopia east of Eden. The only way that we are ever going to have that communion with God and live in a place that was designed for us to live in our true home is on the other side of this life. And that's something that all these characters in Hebrews 11 understood. It's something that Lewis understood too. That's the life that we need to live as straying pilgrims, not belonging here and understanding that what we are actually living for, what we're actually doing is preparing not for this life to be comfortable, but for the next. This life we labor and toil and struggle. It's not how it will be in the next life because we are where we belonged all along. The place that we were actually made for, the place that God actually meant for us to be. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Normally, this is the part of the video where you would expect me to ask you to like the video and subscribe to the channel, but the truth is, I don't really care whether you do or not. In fact, you know what? Don't subscribe. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world in the state of Alabama that you should probably be aware of. So, yeah, go ahead and subscribe. Or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.